Happy holidays and welcome to Talking Data, which is our work weekly series of podcasts in which we highlight pertinent bond and equity market themes. Today, we're featuring Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. We will be discussing the white hot topic of inflation. Ben, in our podcast last week, you spoke on inflation. You put out a wonderful installment today as a follow-up that focuses on ETF flows into inflation-friendly assets. Give me a quick synopsis of your observations. Yeah, so what's really wild uh, really over the past maybe month or so is how much flows and returns are mimicking the months kind of building up into 2017. So late 2016 going into the early portion of 2017, which ultimately yielded global synchronized growth. Now, you know, Jim and I have been joking that we have this roaring 20s, this great euphoric uh, state the economy is gonna be in next year, um, which may come to pass, but you know, investors are somewhat uh, positioning for that, you know, for global synchronized growth. So what we noticed was on an ETF flow basis, if you look at the kind of the assets that are inflation friendly, everything from materials, industrials, real estate, and then commodities and tips, of course, uh, over 10 billion, which might not sound humongous, humongous, but on a relative basis is, um, have gone into those ETFs, which is the really the largest amount since December, 2016, again, right ahead of global synchronized growth. So investors are positioning for somewhat of this scenario, this Goldilocks scenario, and we can see it in the equity markets too. And so the big question going forward is, are we going to start doing something we haven't done since the crisis, or really, as Jim would say, that you know, in 20 years is produce inflation. Um, and one thing that I'm this kind of a sticking point for me right now is we've seen the entire tips break even curve, which is you know inflation expectations from two years out to 30 years. That curve is about to invert, which means that the two year is getting up to 200 basis points, while the 30 year or 10 year and 30 year sit right below 200 basis points. Every time that's happened, that's led to lower tips break evens, meaning lower inflation expectations over the next you know three to six months. So for that to be different, we're going to have to potentially see this curve invert and by a decent amount, meaning the Fed's got to let inflation, they got to lean into it and let inflation run hot, hotter than markets would like, which means we get this inverted tips break even curve. And so we got to do something different and we'll see if that's the case uh, next quarter. Thanks, Ben. Jim, I'm going to turn it over to you next. I'm looking at your total return review that you published on December 1st, 2020. As of that date, the total return for the Barclays Tips Index was 9.73% year to date as of, as of 11.30.20 in a bond fund. Give me a summary of what you see relative to inflation in the markets. Yeah, if you look over to the column on the left, the quarter to date column, You'll see that the tips break evens did much better than the nominal yields, <clears throat> which are above it. So the 10 year was down 1.29%, and the, end, and the uh, Barclays tips index was up 47 basis points during the same period. So it outperformed. It's consistent with what Ben was saying as well, too. This rotation that we've seen in the market is definitely positioning itself for growth in the market. And just to kind of take what Ben was saying one step further, uh, the markets are expecting nominal growth next year. Uh, in the past, if you said nominal growth, well, that just meant the real component would really just push the whole nominal growth thing up. Remember, nominal is, is real growth plus inflation. Question is, if we get nominal growth in 2021, how much of that will become inflation as we move forward from here? And it, I think it's, uh, and Ben, disagree with me on this if you want. I, I think it's kind of hard to tell when a market is positioning itself for real growth as opposed to inflation, because when it thinks you're going to get a global synchronized upturn, it runs into the kind of the same things it would run into if it thought that inflation was going to come back as well, too. Tips break evens, industrials, basic materials, that kind of stuff really goes in both scenarios. So, you know, that's why I like to say it's going to be nominal growth that it's positioning for. And then we could start in on the quibble as to whether that nominal growth is going to be uh, real growth or inflation. What say you, Ben? 
Yeah, so I mean, the, the big story <laughs> to me is that if you look at these decompositions, you know, academically, or you do some nice little uh, work on your own, you'll find that the inflation premium within yields and tits break evens just hasn't grown yet. So investors are apprehensive. They don't want to price in that inflation premium, like you're saying. If they do, then we start to see some things potentially get interesting, like the correlation that we were talking about before between the VIX and tits break evens, that should go appreciably positive. Um, and and so on. But um, without that inflation premium now, um, you know, I think that's a led investors to kind of underprice a tips break even. So you can actually take that totally opposite side of the coin here and say, with all these risk assets doing so well, now with industrials roaring back, we got some of the going out stocks uh, starting to do better. If you build a little bit of a model, do it many different ways and say, where should tips break evens be relative to risk assets? Well, it says, 10-year tips break even should be as high as 220 to 225 basis points, and we're still sub 200. So why haven't they burst uh, above 2%? And that gets kind of what I think you and both of us have been arguing about is that the, the market just isn't sure yet about pricing in 2 plus percent headline inflation for the long haul. We know we're going to get it next year, like we've been joking around. We're going to have this. We're going to have an inflation mirage in April and May. We're going to post probably 2.4, 2.5% core PC, the Fed's favorite um, uh, measure. And that's going to get people hot and bothered, but it's, you know, could be kind of a mirage. Who knows if that's really going to last and endure. So, um, you know, there's still a lot of big question marks. I would watch, if anything, VIX tips break even correlation. I would watch that inverted tips break even curve. If it does happen, can it last? Can it persist? And that would be, to me, the ultimate sign the Fed is leaning into inflation. So the big question I kind of have, Jim, that I would love an answer on is, do you think the Federal Reserve, let's say that we do get inflation, we get this nice April, May base effect, but then we also start posting 20 plus percent, 20 plus basis point um, month over month changes in CPI, meaning that we're running kind of hotter. Do you think the Fed has the wherewithal to not um, do something about that and get a little hawkish? Yeah. Um, before I answer that, I just want to throw out one other quick thing, too. Part of what could be holding back inflation, and you detailed this well in the last podcast about that the model should be showing that we have break evens at 20 to 225 or so basis points, and we're around 200, is the immediate lockdown that we're having right now will have a dampening effect on the economy. If you look at economic forecasts for the first quarter, or if you look at the payroll forecasts that are starting to matriculate in for January, they're not good. They're not good, but everybody knows they're not good. That's because we've got this spike in COVID cases. We've got this unfortunate spike in COVID deaths and everybody's expecting that the near term is gonna be depressant on the economy and that might be holding back inflation as well too. And that's why I think coming out of that, you'll see that burst of inflation uh, come. Now to your question. <clears throat> If we do get 240, 250 on corporate inflation, and you're right, the base effects, once you get past the lockdowns, the April over April or May over May data should show something like that, the Fed will take victory laps. This is exactly what we wanted. This is exactly what we planned for. And they'll say a bunch of stuff about average inflation targeting. Um, but it, as I'd like to say, I don't think it's their call. I will mark you, remind everybody, <clears throat> the fourth quarter of 2018, they announced that they were going to let the balance sheet run off like $600 billion for all of 2019. Remember, this was around this time of year, 2018, two years ago. They're going to let the balance sheet run off by $600 billion. The market and um, Paul said it was going to be like watching paint dry and it was going to be on automatic pilot. The market threw a fit. It fell 20% from top to bottom. And by January 4th, literally two weeks later, the Fed came out and responded to the market and said, oh no, we're gonna be patient and flexible. It's all gonna be okay. And at the end of the day, they only let the balance sheet run up 380 billion of the 600 and then they stopped. <clears throat> so what will the Fed do? They'll take credit for the rise of inflation. They'll say it's what they planned on. If the market agrees with them, eh, you know, yields go to 1.1 or 1.2% on the 10 year note, you know, by the end of the first quarter. In other words, what I'm trying to say is 20 basis points, maybe 30 basis points higher, no big deal. The Fed's right and everything's okay. You start to see them going, you know, 
above 120 towards, towards 130 or 140 on the 10 year note, then that could be somewhat of akin to the fourth quarter of 2018. The Fed says, this is what we want. The market has a different opinion about it. And then um, we'll have to see where the Fed goes. Uh, last thought for you on this. <clears throat> if you're not an equity, if you're not a bond guy, and you're an equity guy listening, well, what's the difference between 120 and 140 on yields? Does it really matter that much? In the world of the bond market, in the world of unlimited leverage, it does. As I like to tell my equity friends, you know, a great thing about the bond market is once I'm approved on some counterparty's list, if I personally approved on their list, I could call them up and say, buy me, I want to buy a billion dollars worth of bonds. And then my next call is, can I talk to your repo desk to finance the whole transaction and I'm done? You can't do that in equities. You got it. You actually have to have some money to actually put up on this. So the bond market runs on extreme leverage. When you get these kind of moves uh, in the bond market and what you could wind up having is a very adverse reaction within the market itself. You saw a little bit of that in March of this year with the gyrations in the bond market and regarding around the leverage that's in it as well too. So don't discount that that extra move higher can be meaningful. So given that this is our last podcast of 2020, I would just ask each of you to kind of give a summary of the year and your thoughts, your outlook for the first half of 2021. <clears throat> I'll go first. Um, unprecedented year. That, you know, basically, the, you know, 2020 is the year, and I'm talking about just the markets. I'm not getting into politics or culture or anything else. This was the year that you could have said, you started the year and said, here's how markets don't respond to things. And then that's exactly what they did. You know, starting with a 35% decline in five weeks and then recouping that entire decline within three months after that. There's no example of a major stock market falling that much in such a short period of time and recovering that fast um, as well, too. I thought also there was a big shift in the mentality of how investors put their money to work, that the individual stock and investors buying stocks and options and, and playing individual names came back into vogue again, as opposed to buying into funds um, as well, too. And then there was <clears throat> this entire belief about what I'll just refer to as MMT. Um, we're running a $3.2 trillion deficit. January 1st, if you would have said that the market, we were gonna run a $3.2 trillion deficit, you would have been asked to leave the room that we're not gonna get there by the end of the year. And if we did get there by the end of the year, the last thing you would have also predicted was, Oh, and of course, the stock market would be raging and the market, everybody would be bullish and interest rates would be low. And that's exactly what we've had happen. And it gets to my point that if we don't have a consequence to these big deficits, and I have a forecast that we are going to have inflation, and that's what I believe, but I'm hoping, I'm holding out, I could be wrong on that. We don't have inflation. Well, then there's no reason to stop these big deficits because if you do it, and all it produces is, I'd like to say in these podcasts, if you produce these deficits, if you just pass stimulus bills like we did this past weekend, and you just send people money, and all you do is produce higher stock prices, more jobs, and give everybody extra spending power, then we're never ever gonna stop doing that until we've gone too far. So that's what I mean by that it's been unprecedented. For 21, I hate to be the broken record, but I do think that the story is for 21 is gonna be inflation. Does it return or doesn't it return? And hopefully in the first half of the year, that will become apparent. Thank you, Jen. Ben, your thoughts? Yeah, it's hard to refute that MMT you know, became more of a mainstream, a more understood and accepted um, to a certain extent uh, thought. It's, I don't think it's necessarily been adopted yet, but maybe we'll look back and say 2020 with the pandemic and the, you know, the crap show um, mm -hmm. that we all went through and really the unexpected nature of markets uh, response. And then the wherewithal of the consumer, you know, fiscal policy did do what it was supposed to do with good amplified savings, amplified uh, spending, and the economy, you know, it dug out of a hole very, very quickly, as you just said, Jim. And maybe looking back, this will be the, the you know, the start of MMT. Um, you know, the Stephanie Kelton's book, I know, is one of the most popular, of course, um, this year for many of us. Um, you know, I thought it was fantastic. Uh, that's a whole nother debate, though. 
Uh, but you know, for me, I think now uh, we've been big on the industrial economy roaring back since about July or so, and that's 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 been happening. You know, China was the one to dig us out first. Now it's kind of bleeding over here to the U.S. Hopefully, the, uh, these additional strains and so on don't clamp back down and force the industrial economy to go in reverse. But I think next year for me is yeah, inflation's big without a doubt. You know, we're a fixed income shop. We got to be focused on that. But also is this global synchronized growth. So uh, as Jim was saying, that real side, you know, the nominal side of the growth story um, is we need to see that global synchronized growth for investors to feel comfortable with this extreme risk on positioning that they currently have. If we start to see that falter, um, I think that's going to be a big shock and a big issue. So the whole, this whole period of synchronized growth is starting with China, kind of how it has um, in, in prior episodes, like in 2017, and you know Europe coming online, the U.S., um, and we'll see if that can really get going. If, if not, by the middle of next year, and maybe not even maybe even Q1 um, of next year, I think there could be some. Um, some problems for the markets if that doesn't come to pass. So for me, um, the year will be about global synchronized growth coming or not coming. And within that certainly is the inflation story. Um, and yeah, any forecaster last year looks like a fool <laughs> uh, for this year. It was, you know, it's, it was an all but um, a difficult year. Jim was uh, at one of the first people I know to get really hot on the COVID story and being a big deal for markets that worked out so, you know, worked out he was right. Um, from there on, no one knew what was going to happen with risk assets. It was just so difficult. So um, let's hope that's not the case for 21, even though we all want to see our portfolios you know, keep rising and rising. Well, thank you both. Really appreciate it. And thank you to our audience for joining us today. As a reminder, Arbor Research and Trading is an institutional research and brokerage firm. Our two most prominent research offerings are Bianca Research and Arbor Data Science. For further information, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at farberresearch.com and have a safe and wonderful holiday.